Okay, um, good morning everybody. Uh, I'm Fuki Hasama from the Division of Medical Genetics at UW and I'm very pleased to be here. Um, my job today is to talk to you about the genetics of kidney cancer. So this is a brief overview of my talk. Uh, today I'm gonna give you a little bit of background about my field, which is medical genetics. Uh, when I moved to Seattle eight years ago, um, I met my neighbors across the street and they asked me what I do and I said, I'm a geneticist. And uh, I said, I'm a doctor. And then they, they said, what kind of a doctor? And I said, I'm a geneticist. And they said, oh, you're not a real doctor then. <laughs> So uh, I think what they were thinking is that all geneticists do research, but I actually do have a license to practice medicine in two states, and I see patients every week, so I think I am a real doctor. <laughs> um, so I'm also gonna go over when should a kidney cancer patient uh, be referred to see a genetics provider. Um, I'm gonna tell you about some of the known uh, hereditary causes of kidney cancer today. And then just at the end for a few minutes, I'll touch briefly on direct-to-consumer genetic testing because this is a very popular question. So uh, the field of genetics basically uh, is the study of heredity and seeks to explain the basis of individual variation that you see uh, in the room as you look around um, and also var variation among different animal species. So medical genetics is a clinical specialty of medicine that deals with genetically influenced variation that is pertinent to human health and disease. And so there are over 20,000 uh, genetic disorders and in the slide here, you can see going from left to right, two children who have progeria or Hutchinson-Guilford syndrome, where small children uh, become prematurely aged and frequently die of heart attacks or strokes at the age of 10 or 12. In the middle is a little girl who has a chromosome aneuploidy condition that many of you have probably heard of, Down syndrome, caused by having an extra copy of chromosome number 21. And on the right is a little boy who has um, albinism, which is a disorder, hereditary disorder of pigmentation, where people make uh, less melanin. So as far as genetics healthcare providers, um, I am a medical geneticist and the director of the clinic at UW and the SCCA. And um, a medical geneticist is a physician who has gone on to do specialty training uh, in the field of medical genetics, which includes the diagnosis, treatment, and management of inherited conditions. Um, we work f closely with genetic counselors, and so a genetic counselor is a person who has a master's level degree and specializes in the medical, genetic, and also the psychosocial effects of having a genetic condition in the family. When you come to my clinic, a medical genetics clinic visit, there's often a lot of preparation, both from our side and from the patient side, so I just wanna let you know that should you come to our clinic. We need to review the medical history, the family history, often do a physical examination, but frequently we ask for uh, medical records for family members because if the person who's affected is not yourself, but your family member, we do wanna look closely at those records to make sure that we are um, on the same page. So medical genetics has um, traditionally been thought of as a field of pediatrics and perhaps prenatal or reproductive medicine, but it's increasingly recognized in the past 10 or 15 years to be important in adult uh, patients and adult medicine. So I've put here a couple of fa uh, examples, famous examples that you may be familiar with. So first is uh, Angelina Jolie, who was very public and um, written about in the New York Times as far as her decision to disclose that she was at risk for hereditary breast and ovarian cancer and went through genetic testing and was found to carry a BRCA gene mutation. Uh, Hank Gathers, the uh, basketball player, died suddenly and unexpectedly from a genetic condition that affects about one in 500 people called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And this is frequently the cause of sudden death in athletes um, on, the, uh, on the field um, of sports. And on the right, you may not know him by name, but Jay Monahan um, was actually, um, uh, what was her name? Yes, Katie Couric's husband, thank you. Um, and Jay Monahan died, uh, unfortunately, at a young age from colon cancer, which is caused by an inherited condition called Lynch syndrome. 
So um, this is basically the statistics for our clinic at the University of Washington. Our clinic actually started in 1959 and was founded by Dr. Arno Matulski, who's the founding uh, division head of medical genetics here in Seattle. So you can see that we um, have exceeded 2,500 patient visits per year, and about half of the patients that we see now, or over 1,000 patients a year, are seen for a cancer genetic indication. Um, I love this uh, photo uh, from 1962, so you can see uh, Dr. Matulski is sitting here, and this is the clinic conference, and they actually just brought the patient into the room, <laughs> and they all met with him simultaneously. So uh, this is the current staff of our clinic. And again, the largest uh, group of patients that we serve is patients with cancer genetic indications. We also see patients with cardiovascular genetic conditions, neurogenetic conditions, and basically any other inherited condition that can present in adults. Uh, we are unique in that we are the only medical system in the state of Washington that has physicians who specialize in the care of adults with genetic conditions, and five of our physicians have been named in Seattle Magazine or Seattle Metropolitan Magazine as top doctors in their field, including me. So <laughs> if you happen to have a copy of the uh, February 2016 Seattle Magazine lying around, then you can uh, read a little bit more about me and my career. Um, so to get to the topic for today, uh, we know that cancer is common and unfortunately affects between one in two and one in three people in their lifetime. And it's estimated that about five to 10% of all cancers are strongly hereditary. What I mean by that is that you're, you are born with a mutation in a gene, typically a tumor suppressor gene, that protects you from developing cancer. We have two copies of every gene, so if you have a mutation in one of the two copies, you've lost half of the natural protection from that gene. And that means that over a lifetime, you're more likely to develop the cancers that are associated with loss of function of that gene. Um, hereditary cancer conditions increase the risk for well-known common cancers, such as breast, breast <coughs> cancer uh, and colon cancer. And, uh, hereditary cancer conditions can also include very rare cancers, such as adrenal cortical carcinoma or retinoblastoma, uh, which is a childhood eye cancer. So um, what I do a lot of the time is take a family history and talk to people about uh, medical conditions in their family. So why do we do this? Why do we spend the time, which can frequently be extensive, and also obtaining uh, medical records for family members, why do we take a family history and look specifically for a genetic predisposition? So this is an example from a colorectal cancer. And what you can see here is that the red line at the bottom is the um, baseline or population risk to develop colon cancer starting from age 20 to age 70. So you can see that the uh, risk rises slowly with age and overall about 6% of people will develop colon cancer in their lifetime. Contrast that with these two well-known hereditary colon cancer conditions. So this stands for hereditary um, non-polyposis colon cancer or Lynch syndrome. And so the lifetime risk of colon cancer by about age 70 is about 50%. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the risk to develop uh, familial adenomatous polyposis, actually I would say it's closer to 100%, okay. So the idea is what we would like to do with these individuals is to identify them before they develop colon cancer, okay, through genetic evaluation and testing, and then to prevent them from developing colon cancer uh, with surgery or with screening particularly with Lynch syndrome, there's often a long um, phase where patients have tubular adenomas or precancerous polyps, and if they can be removed before they become cancerous, then that person may never develop the cancer associated with this condition. So, um, is there a hereditary cancer condition in your family? Again, remember that most cancers are sporadic, meaning not strongly genetic, and are caused by some of the risk factors that Dr. Tycote brought up. So clues to the presence of a hereditary cancer condition in the family include things like a cancer diagnosed prior to the age of 50, 
Okay. And again, this is a rule of thumb. It's not an absolute rule. Uh, having the same or re genetically related cancers in multiple generations. So if there are two generations in the family who've both had kidney cancer or three generations, we at least ask the question or start to be con become concerned that there could be a hereditary basis for those cancers. Um, there are some cancers that are genetically related, such as colon cancer and <coughs> uterine cancer. And again, if we see these patterns in the family, then we think about particular genetic predispositions. Another rule is um, having primary cancers in paired organs. So a woman who has bilateral breast cancer or a woman or man who has bilateral renal cancer is more likely to have a underlying, again, genetic predisposition to have developed that cancer. And then finally, individuals who have certain types of rare cancers, such as any man who develops breast cancer, we consider whether he had a genetic predisposition to develop that. And that, again, is some, caused by some of the same um, genes as that cause early onset breast cancer in women, but additionally some other genetic causes that, don't, that do not affect women. So I have the same slide as Dr. Tycote, so I feel good about that, that we have the same information. Um, so there are almost 63,000 new cases of um, kidney cancer diagnosed in 2016. So 5% uh, of those would be estimated to have a genetic cause. So about 2,500 cases of kidney cancer per year would have a strongly genetic basis. And uh, this is a list of some of the hereditary or uh, genetic kidney cancer syndromes. I'll give you just a minute to absorb these. Okay. Um, but rather than just sort of um, giving you all of these rare diseases and rare names of things that are very difficult to, uh, to recall, I thought actually it might be helpful to just share with you a couple of the patients that I've seen. So the first case is a 37-year-old woman who had shortness of breath, night sweats, and noticed um, a mass in her neck, and so she underwent a lymph node biopsy, which showed a carcinoma with, that was consistent with a primary papillary renal um, cancer. So her past medical history was significant actually for having fibroids when she was very young. So fibroids, of course, are extremely common in the population, but they typically happen um, at older ages. So the fact that she had fibroids in her severe fibroids in her 20s, to the extent that she actually had surgery for it, is unusual. Uh, her family history is notable for having uh, two children, four brothers, and her mother in her 70s also had fibroids with an early hysterectomy but has had no cancer diagnosis. And her father died in his 50s of heart disease. So um, what I thought of for her is actually a genetic condition called hereditary leiomyomatosis and renal cell cancer, or REED, R-E-E-D syndrome. Um, and it has three major features. So the first one is having actually fibroids on the skin, okay, which you can sometimes see on physical examination. The second feature is uterine fibroids in women, and these are like the regular fibroids that uh, women develop, but they happen at younger ages and they tend to be multiple and severe. And the third feature is renal cancer. So the combination of early fibroids in herself and her mother and the type of renal cancer that she had made me consider this condition for this woman. Um, so this basically just goes over some a, a little bit more detail of the uh, cutaneous leiomyomas or fibroids, the uterine fibroids, and the renal tumors. Um, and notice that not everyone with this condition develops kidney cancer. So only about 10 to 15 percent of people who have Reed syndrome develop kidney cancer. And it typically happens um, at a younger age. So again, following that rule that inherited cancers tend to affect people at younger ages than sporadic cancer cancers. Um, so there are screening recommendations for this condition. And uh, we know that Reed syndrome is caused by mutations in the fumarate hydratase gene. So um, genetic test results, I will let you know, are not always positive or negative. Any genetic test can come back as positive, negative, or uncertain. And so when we sent testing for this patient, she actually did have that third category of genetic result. So it was not a definitive result, but she had a substitution of one protein building block called arginine for the normal protein building block called glycine at position number 97. 
So the difficulty that I have as a geneticist with this particular result is that I very strongly suspect clinically that this is the disease that she has. Um, however, because we're not absolutely certain about the significance of the genetic test result, I would not want to use this in a predictive way to test uh, unaffected family members and to make irreversible, that is, uh, for example, surgical decisions. We did counsel her uh, family that we do consider them to be at higher risk and that they should undergo screening um, for kidney cancer and evaluation for the skin findings. The second case is a uh, young man who was sent to my clinic for overgrowth. So the reason that that's considered to be potentially a genetic condition is that uh, people who are very big and large, uh, there, and there are a number of uh, described genetic overgrowth syndromes, some of them are associated with increased risk of cancers. And so that's what this young man was sent for. So uh, he was six foot eight, uh, he weighed 247 pounds, and when I measured his head circumference, it was 65 centimeters. And again, 60 centimeters is um, almost at the top of the curve in terms of being uh, very large. So I had them stand next to one of the genetic counselors in our clinic, Robin Bennett there on the left, so you get a little perspective. And then on the right, you can see my shoe size, which is seven, <laughs> compared to his shoe size, which is 16 and a half. Okay. So when it turns out when he had been six years old, he was actually evaluated for overgrowth. He was already big at that time. And the parents were told when he was six years old that he might have a different overgrowth condition called Soto syndrome. But at the time, there was no genetic testing available to confirm or exclude that. One of the features of um, Soto syndrome is advanced bone age. So he did have a bone age x-ray, which was normal. In the meantime, from then until the time I had see him, seen him, he had actually developed some um, papules or growth on his gums, which were removed because they were bothering him, and they were consistent with hamartomas, which is a benign kind of tumor. But that actually gave me potentially a clue to what the diagnosis was that he actually has. Um, when we're talking about things like height and weight, it is important to consider the family background, and his uh, parents, his uh, father and his sister are both quite tall, actually. Oops, okay. So I'm sorry this is so blurry, but um, I took a picture of his tongue because he also had some of these papules on his tongue here, so little extra bumps. Um, and so I considered that he had a genetic condition called Cowden syndrome, also known as P P10 hamartoma syndrome, because they have various types of hamartomas as well as overgrowth, um, including characteristically a very large head size. And so um, his results were positive for a single base deletion that results in a uh, what we call a premature termination codon. So basically, typically, you start at the beginning of a gene, you read through to the end, stop reading, and then you produce a full-length protein. In this case, what this causes is a um, shift in the reading frame, and so basically the protein gets chopped off um, earlier than expected. So this is clearly a disease-causing mutation and consistent with the diagnosis of Cowden syndrome in him. So once we identify a mutation in a family, like in this young man, we can test their relatives to find out who is at risk and then offer them appropriate screening and who is not at risk, and then they wouldn't need to go on and have more screening. So the first woman that I mentioned, we would recommend continued screening for all of her close family members because we, we can't tell through genetic te testing who is and who's not at risk. In this case, we could offer testing to his sister and other family members and see who does not need to have screening for Cowden syndrome. So these are the uh, major and minor criteria for Cowden syndrome for the aficionados in the audience. Um, and then these are the cancer risks that are specifically associated with Cowden syndrome. So notice that there is a significant lifetime risk of kidney cancer, but importantly, it's not the only cancer risk associated with Cowden syndrome. And in fact, we do consider this to be um, a breast cancer um, risk condition as well. The thyroid cancer risk is high enough that uh, routine screening for thyroid cancer by physical examination and thyroid ultrasound is recommended, and there are some other associated risks there as well. 
So um, some of you have probably seen President Obama's um, address in which he talked about precision medicine and how do we turn um, the science of genetics uh, into actual medical therapies. So one of the things that we can do is basically we can change someone's care uh, quite soon after we make a genetic diagnosis. So these are specific recommendations for the uh, management of individuals who have been confirmed to have Cowden syndrome. So for example, for women, it changes when and how often they start to have mammography. Uh, women should consider having endometrial biopsies or ultrasound to, uh, uh, for the risk of uh, endometrial or uterine cancer. As I mentioned, uh, annual thyroid ultrasound is recommended. Uh, colonoscopy screening is recommended to begin 15 years earlier, and then uh, routine screening for the kidney cancer risk as well, beginning at age 40. The um, last case that I'll present to you today is a 35-year-old man who came to our clinic because he already knew that he had a genetic condition in his family. And so we had seen and evaluated other, family, uh, other members of his family, and um, he was at risk. So in terms of what the medical problems in the family were, several family members had presented with something called spontaneous pneumothorax, which basically means they uh, part of the lung collapsed and then they have sh acute shortness of breath and went to the emergency room for that. Um, when they went to the emergency room, they could treat it but didn't really know what caused it. Um, other, family, other members of his family had had um, kidney cancer. And so he came and we had seen other family members. We had the information about what the mutation was in the family. And so he came because he was interested in knowing whether he was affected or not. So um, because I already had all of this background information, I was very clued in to what he could have and I knew the diagnosis. So um, in meeting him, he actually had, and it's quite subtle here. I don't know if I can turn the lights down at all, but he has, can I turn down the lights in the front? Or can you see this? He has like little tiny bumps on his forehead. I don't know if you can see that or not. But because I was looking for them so intensely, oh, perfect, thank you. See these little things? So these are actually the skin manifestation of the genetic condition that he has, okay? And so those are called fibrofolliculomas, and they are a cardinal feature of another genetic condition associated with kidney cancer called Berthog-Dubé syndrome. And again, um, individuals who have this have a greatly increased chance to have spontaneous pneumothorax compared with the average person. There are other um, skin findings. And importantly, of course, they have an increased risk for renal tumors, which tend to be uh, chromophobe tumors. Berthog Dubé is caused by mutations in a single gene called folliculin. And since we knew the mutation in his family, we didn't need to go searching through the entire gene. We could just go right to the position of the known mutation in his family and give him a clear, yes, you inherited it, or no, you did not inherit it, kind of an answer. Um, because of the nature of Berthog Dubé syndrome affecting different organ systems, they may present to a urologist with a renal tumor or an oncologist uh, because of the kidney cancer. Again, they may be seen first by an emergency room doctor or a pulmonary specialist because of the pneumothorax. And a number of patients with Berthog Dubé actually present to dermatologists because of these skin findings, which are benign, but which are an important clue to the presence of the underlying genetic condition. Um, I will say that had he not had the little skin bumps, I still would have offered him genetic testing because a number of patients actually don't have the fibrofolliculomas. So uh, to summarize, uh, in terms of red flags for kidney cancer, um, I think the most important one is someone who's diagnosed with kidney cancer at a younger age has a greater chance to have it because of an inherited genetic reason. Um, bilateral kidney cancers, again, is a clue uh, that increases the chance that there's an underlying genetic reason for the cancers. A positive family history for kidney cancers or especially other cancers before the age of 50. Uh, pneumothorax that's unexplained, and again, certain skin findings suggestive of some genetic conditions. Okay, so in the last few minutes, I just wanna talk about uh, home DNA testing. So um, about 12 years ago, Time Magazine named um, 
the home DNA test the invention of the year. And they said that from a simple at-home test, you could find out your risks for many, many diseases. So uh, fast forward to 2013, and the FDA actually sent a cease and, dis cease and desist order to 23andMe, uh, which is the uh, most well-known and popular home DNA testing service. Um, by this time, over a million people have actually ordered and had uh, DNA testing at home, where you just spit into a little tube, send it in. Um, for a while, 23andMe was giving reports where they gave, they estimated what your risk of certain conditions was, and the FDA objected to that. So uh, now they no longer provide those reports, but they do give you uh, the raw data, basically your DNA sequence of the A, C's, T's, and G's, and they say you can go look this up yourself. Um, as a geneticist, I don't recommend this, okay? Um, both because I think it does take a lot of uh, experience and training to really be able to understand and interpret genetic test results in a medical context, and also because I personally and my colleagues in our clinic have seen um, unfortunate examples where people have misunderstood or misinterpreted genetic test results, and that has led to some unfortunate consequences. <clears throat> okay, so that is the end of my talk. <laughs> no, no, that's Dubs. <laughs> he's, he's the official mascot of UW. I've met Dubs, though. <laughs> Yes, yes, we're doing very well on time, so we want to field a couple now. Sure, yeah, we'll still do a panel because people may think of things. So. Happy to. Go ahead. Uh huh. Um, I had a question about you, you said about 2,500 of kidney cancers are hereditary, and then you listed some. And I have papillary, and I have melanoma. Thank you. And I have melanoma removed, and I was diagnosed at 48. So okay, we should talk. <laughs> Come and see me in the clinic. <laughs> okay, so that leads to my second question, which is, um, is this stuff generally covered by insurance? Excellent question. So, so that's a, a good question that applies to, I think, a lot of people in the audience, whereas your particular question, we should probably delve into more one-on-one, -on -one, right? And then um, my follow-up to that was when you have family members tested. Are they covered? It, well, not mm -hmm. only that, but can it prevent them from getting insurance coverage? Because like as a cancer patient, I have trouble getting insurance coverage until right. I'm on Molina. Right, yes. Most people wouldn't yes. touch me. Okay, excellent question. Thank you for that. Um, so first of all, genetic services usually are covered by insurance. Um, including Medicare and including Medicaid. So there's two types of genetic services. The first one is the visit, and the second one is the testing, right? So again, usually the visit with the doctor or the genetic counselor is a covered benefit. Mm -hmm. um, insurances differ as to how the extent that they cover genetic testing. All insurances will cover some cancer genetic testing, typically for the most well-recognized and common conditions like breast cancer genetic testing and colon cancer genetic testing. For the rarer we get, the less likely it is that the insurance company has a pre-existing um, rule or coverage decision. So oftentimes what we need to do, especially for rare genetic conditions, uh, is pre-authorization. So where we work with the insurance company and we explain to them why we want to order this testing and what the medical necessity of it is. Um, so that's part of the service that we provide. Um, before and after the visit. All of the patients that I showed you had clinical genetic testing covered by insurance. In terms of family members, again, that's a very important question. So um, again, if we identify a mutation in the family, we can offer site-specific um, testing to family members, which cost one-tenth of what the original testing costed. So typically, our genetic testing costs between $2,000 and $5,000. But for a family member who's at risk with a known mutation, the cost is more like $250 to $500. Um, in terms of discrimination, there was a federal law that was enacted during uh, George W. Bush's administration called the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, which makes it illegal to discriminate against people based on genetic test results or family history. Um, so if you have a diagnosis that, um, 
it, what I want to say is that it's different to, um, in terms of how insurance rates are affected by a diagnosis of cancer versus a genetic being having a positive genetic test result but having no cancer diagnosis. So in that latter case, they cannot drop you from health insurance or raise your rates based on a genetic test result. Do you see what I'm saying? And most insurances would consider it to be um, medically necessary and a covered benefit if you're if you have a close relative first or second or third degree relative who has a positive genetic test result because in the long run it's less expensive to prevent cancer than to treat it you. you're welcome mm -hmm. um, early on in your discussion you uh, you mentioned uh, uh, a gene that actually targets cancer you said if, uh, and we have two two of those genes Mm -hmm. uh, that have a, one's gone and uh, we're at a higher risk. Have they figured out a way where they can actually introduce that gene into a person's system to, to actually go after the cancer? And, and would it be effective after you've already uh, been found to have cancer? Um, so uh, again, just to, just to uh, repeat that part of the talk for people who may not remember it. So I was explaining that, um, so there, we have genes that do many different things in our bodies, right? So some of our genes have a natural role as what we call tumor suppressor genes. So they exist to protect us from cancer and all of us have those genes. So um, in general, we have two copies of every gene, one inherited from mom and one inherited from dad. And so for these tumor suppressor genes, a person who has a hereditary predisposition to cancer has one normal gene and the second copy of the gene has a mutation in it. So that's why they've lost half of that natural protection um, from that uh, tumor suppressor gene. Uh, what you're talking about is something along the lines of gene therapy where you would restore the function of a gene. Um, I'm sorry, but we're not quite there yet. Okay, so that's something to work on for the future, definitely. And there are certainly, there's a lot of um, news now about gene editing technology and how you can, you know, basically with molecular scissors cut out a gene that's not working and replace it with a gene version of the gene that is working, um, that's not being done in people yet at this time. It's still in development. 